Good afternoon, everyone. All right, we're already a minute past, so I'm kind of watching for anybody else who's trickling in. But um, I'll go ahead and get started so we don't waste any time. We want to thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us. We're really excited for this quarter's book talk. We have Stephanie Rosebra and Michelle Ablin from Collection Development. And they are actually going to present some of their favorite titles in partnership with Orca Book Publishers. So without further ado, I am going to hand it over to them. And feel free to throw any comments or questions into the chat throughout the presentation. We would love to hear your feedback. Uh, thanks, Emily. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, as Emily mentioned, we will be sharing some of our favorite titles and series from Orca with you this afternoon, but we also have uh, a few newer fall titles that we're really excited about that we wanted to share with you too. Um, before we get started, uh, I just want to introduce ourselves again. As Emily said, I'm Michelle. This is Stephanie. Hello. <laughs> We're both in the collection development department here at Booksource. I've been here about 10 years. Um, I come from a library background. Uh, Stephanie's been here almost five. She comes from an ELA background. So um, they call us the book nerds of Booksource, which we, <laughs> we wear pretty proudly. So um, that's us. Uh, before we get started, I, I did just want to share a little bit about why we chose to partner with Orca Publishing uh, for this book talk. If any of you are familiar with them, you might know them mostly from their high-low material for middle grade and high school, but they also do you know, so much more than that. They are one of the leading publishers of quality titles from indigenous uh, voices. Um, First Nations and Native American uh, voices are still one of the most underrepresented groups in children's literature and in publishing in general. And Orca uh, does dedicates a large portion of their yearly list to publishing and promoting these voices and stories. Um, they also produce a lot of great quality nonfiction, which we'll be sharing in a little bit. Um, but first, I'm going to pass things off to Stephanie. She's going to share some of her favorite late year titles with you. Uh, here she is. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, like Michelle mentioned, uh, my name is Stephanie, and I am going to share. I have three titles I chose that are some of my favorites that have come out just over the past few months. And they're not exclusively from Orca publishers that Michelle just talked about, but they're just some of the ones that I'm personally most excited about and wanted to share. Um, so, the first one I'm going to share with you is called A Rover Story. It's written by Jasmine Warga. Um, her debut author, uh, Other Words, her de debut title, Other Words for home um, was one of my favorites when it came out a couple of years ago. And so if you're familiar with that story, if you like that author, I think you'll love um, this one as well, although it is very different from Other Words for Home. Um, her first book was written in verse, and this one is not. It's a chapter book, um, and it does span uh, an interest range for, for middle appropriate for middle grade. I think anyone from third grade through at least seventh would be entertained by this story. <laughs> Um, it's a fictional story, but there are a lot of STEM elements as it's told um, from the point of view of a Mars rover. So a very unique perspective um, that you kind of get inside the head of this robot. So the story starts off with resilience in the NASA labs as the scientists are hard at work um, assembling um, resilience and testing him um, and getting him ready for his, his mission to Mars. Um, and as they're doing this, one scientist in particular is really interacting with, with this robot on a more, like on a human level, um, talking to resilience, sharing thoughts and feelings as they're working together. And the robot starts to pick up what some of these feelings mean and even start to experience some actual human emotions. Um, so finally the day comes where resilience has passed all of his tests. Um, they launch him into space and he's set out on this amazing journey to a, a far away dusty red planet called Mars. And as he's exploring this planet, he's also accompanied by a drone um, called Fly. So he's got his little buddy on Mars. He's not completely alone, uh, but Fly is a traditional 
computer robot and uh, they can communicate, but Fly is confused as to why is resilience feeling these weird things, these weird emotions uh, that Fly doesn't understand. Um, so one of resilience, resilience's most you know important elements of the mission is he really wants to return to Earth. And traditionally, once you send a rover to Mars, they don't come back. It's super expensive to try to retrieve them. Um, but he wants to be the first one to return home. So he takes his duties very seriously. He encounters dust storms and cliffs and other dangers as he tries to find that the best possible specimens and best possible research he can do that will um, require NASA to send him back to Earth. So that's his mission. So I, I think this, um, the unique point of view for this story brings really lends itself to being appealing for um, both avid and reluctant readers alike. So I think this has a wide uh, range of appeal. Next up, I wanted to share a picture book called Song in the City. This is a picture book written by Daniel Bernstrom and illustrated by Jenna, Jenin Mohammed. Uh, as you can see, it's very brightly illustrated. The colors are lovely. It's also very lyrical um, and, and poetic. So it makes a great read aloud. Uh, and as you'll see, I've got some spreads to share here that um, it's really full of onomatopoeia. So in this story, it features little young little Emmeline, who is visually impaired. She sets out one Sunday morning with her grandma um, into their busy, bustling city. And the whole time she's trying to explain to her grandma um, this, the music that she hears throughout the city that are, that are all the noises that the city makes. Um, and to Emmeline, they are music. Sunday morning, Emmeline heard a sing-along song, a busy city symphony that followed her along. Tap, tap, a tap, yip, yip, a yip, sizzle, sizzle, honky, honk, pitter, patter, drip. <clears throat> But grandma is very busy trying to navigate the city. She's very distracted. She doesn't really understand what Emmeline is saying when she's trying to convince grandma about this music she hears. Um, she just doesn't get it. Grandma Jean, said Emmeline, don't you hear that tinkling tune? Emmeline, said Grandma Jean, we'll be getting off here soon. Grandma, listen to the city. Don't you see right now I'm busy. I've told you that's the city, not a song. And eventually grandma does try to sit back and listen to the noises and see if she can hear some music. She heard the wind, a few crass crows, a crying cat, some crinkling clothes, a train somewhere, a bus beep beeped, a cell phone buzzed, a siren shrieked. Then one hand darkened grandma Jean's eyes. Try this way. <clears throat> So it really wasn't until little Emmeline covers grandma's eyes and gets her just to sit back and listen to all the sounds. Grandma finally does come around and understands how there is beautiful music all around us. Um, so I, I, I think this story is just charming. Um, again, great potential for read aloud. It also uh, lends itself to a wide variety of discussions, onomatopoeia being one, music, visual impairments. Um, and I really think mindfulness, um, as, as Emmeline really works hard to remind all of us um, that it's important sometimes to just take a step back and really stop and pay attention to the world around us through a new lens. And finally, the last title I have to share is another picture book. This one's called Going Places, Victor Hugo Green and His Glorious Book. It's written by two award-winning, um, or by an award-winning author and illustrated by an award-winning illustrator, Ta Tanya Bolden and Eric Velasquez. Um, and it is a picture book biography. So it's the true story about Victor Hugo Green, who was the creator of the Green Book. So Victor Hugo Green started his career in the 1930s as a mail carrier. And around this time, more and more highways were being built throughout the United States. Automobiles were becoming uh, more affordable. So people were just, more and more Americans were, were hitting the road and doing more and more traveling. 
Um, however, unfortunately, this was also the time of Jim Crow laws and segregation that made it very difficult for um, Black Americans to travel through certain parts of the country. <laughs> So Victor set out to use his network of mail carrier friends, use uh, all the research he could get his hands on to come up with a pamphlet to help guide Black travelers to areas where they could feel more welcome. Um, so he created the Green Book pamphlet um, that included the best, most welcoming places um, to eat, to sleep, even just to stop and stretch your leg as you're driving through the, through the United States. Um, over many years, throughout the 30s, 40s, in the 50s, um, the, the pamphlet grew into a larger book. It, it was a travel guide that com was comprehensive to um, all 50 states. And not only did it include places to eat and sleep, it expanded to include places um, to get a haircut, to get your car fixed, to go hear great music, um, or get new clothes. So it was full of places that were welcoming of these traveling um, Black Americans. So I really uh, love the, the unique illustration style in this text as well. It makes the whole thing kind of have a travel guide feel. Um, and it does have a lot of appeal, uh, I think, even though it's a picture book to older readers as well. So I think it could be used even in those um, secondary classrooms to teach, you know, a historical lesson um, or have just deeper discussions. And there is a timeline in the back and some additional resources as well available in the back matter that tell a little bit more about the time period and a little bit more about Victor Hugo Green himself. Um, so that wraps up my portion. Those are the titles I wanted to share with you. Thank you. And now I'm going to hand it over to Michelle. Hello again. Um, the first series I want to share with you is probably one of my favorite series I'm currently reading. This is the Mighty Muskrats Mystery Series from author Michael Hutchinson. Michael is a citizen of the Mississippawistic Cree Nation in the Treaty 5 territory, which is in Manitoba, Canada. Um, this is a middle grade series about four cousins, Sam, Autumn, Otter, and Chickadee who live in the fictional Cree community of Windy Lake First Nation. Sam and Adam are brothers and they've recently moved to the reservation from the city. So they um, are still getting used to, to daily life on the reservation, as well as learning some of the more subtle cultural aspects of everyday Cree life. Um, Adam is the oldest and strongest of the group. His brother Sam is quieter, more thoughtful. He's kind of the de facto leader of the four. Otter might be the smallest, but he's also the toughest and the boldest. And then Little Chickadee is uh, their IT professional. She handles their tech and all of the research they need to kind of help them along in their uh, queries. So these are contemporary stories set in modern day Canada. Um, they all have engaging characters. Uh, the cousin's grandfather is one of the community's elders. Their uncle is a police officer, so they learn about different cases through him. Um, readers not familiar with uh, First Nations or Cree culture will find a lot to learn about, uh, both current and historical Cree um, struggles and achievements, as well as just everyday life. Um, but at their heart, they're just really fun, engaging mysteries that readers can actually help solve with the provided context clues. All four books have been recommended by the American Indians and Children's Literature website run by author and advocate Debbie Reese. And the third, the, excuse me, the third book in the series, The Case of the Burgled Bundle, was actually named to last year's Best Books of the Year list. Um, the series has been favorably compared to the Boxcar Children mysteries, so if you have kids or students who like the Boxcar Children or books like that about kids um, solving uh, mysteries or crimes in their communities, uh, this should uh, entertain them as well. Uh, this is a planned eight book series, uh, four of which are currently published with the rest coming out in the next couple of years. I just wanted to mention this series is actually published by Second Story Press, which is a small Canadian publisher uh, distributed by Orca. Second Story is 
dedicated to publishing books from marginalized and underrepresented authors and uh, perspectives. Next, I wanted to share uh, Orca Footprints. This is one of their uh, engaging nonfiction series. Um, as you can see here from the covers, there's a wide range of STEM and STEAM and different social topics that are covered. There's an emphasis on sustainability and ethical practices. Um, a lot of the books have different positive and starred reviews from a lot of the professional journals out there. And the series as a whole was given a starred review from School Library Journal. Um, let's see. So in this slide, I just wanted to give you a real feel for what a Footprints book looks like. This is from the book, A Fair Deal, Shopping for Social Justice, which is about fair trade and ethical shopping practices, which is something that a lot of kids are interested in right now. Um, each book in the series contains um, an introduction from the author where they talk about their connection to the topic and why they decided to write about it. Um, there are text features, uh, like diagrams, charts, and more that help support the text. The text blocks are broken up by really engaging and current modern photographs that help illustrate um, the world viewpoint that a lot of these books present. Each book also has a series of sidebars um, specific to the topic at hand that give you a little bit more insider information into what people are doing around the given subject area. So in this book, all of the subject, all of the sidebars are called In My Basket, and the author writes about her own experiences she and her family have kind of encountered with making a change to more ethical buying practices, which can kind of model um, choices that students reading it can make. Each book in the series also has a chapter included which outlines what kids can do to kind of help with the issues they face. I think a lot of the issues written about in Footprints um, cause anxiety. <laughs> They're kind of big issue topics and it can really feel like uh, one person can't do anything or make a difference, especially if you're young and you don't feel you have a lot of autonomy or power. But what's included in these books are really kind of everyday real world um, changes they can make within their life to help support their ethical choices or things they can um, introduce in their communities to help support making those changes. So as, as we're all aware, we've, we've seen kind of a big resurgent lately in uh, the need for phonics related materials. One of the biggest complaints or maybe negatives we hear about some of the phonics stuff that's out there is that the stories themselves aren't really engaging, especially if you're trying to find something for older readers that are still struggling. So this is the Megan Gregg series. This is a new phonics series from Orca specifically dedicated to kids in grades two and up. They can stretch as high as grades five or six. Uh, these are collections of short stories about friends, Meg and Greg, as they kind of have little adventures around their neighborhood and community. The author, Elspeth Ray, is a certified teacher and literary specialist. And each book, as I said, is a collection of four short stories. And each story focuses on a separate phonogram um, so you can really target the books to kids who are having specific issues with different sounds um, in, in the learning process. Um, all of the books are highly illustrated and contain um, some graphic novel panels as well. Um, they also contain a number of features designed to accommodate and support readers with, excuse me, with dyslexia, including um, shaded paper, uh, a dyslexia friendly typeface and lots of spacing around the letters, the lines, the paragraphs. Um, and the text is closely controlled. It's designed to remove spelling exceptions and advanced words just to really help support and promote readability for kids who aren't having an easy time. What makes this particular series really interesting is that it's designed for shared reading. So the books all contain many layers of text um, designed for different reading levels. So you can have an adult, a tutor, teacher, even a caregiver at home, read the advanced uh, text to the child that's still learning. And then there are story uh, pages of the same story designed specifically for the struggling reader. So here are some interior pages that hopefully help illustrate that. 
Each story has an introductory page, which outlines the specific sounds and phonograms that will be um, illustrated in that specific story. And then the next two pages, you see the one on your left, the white page is the text designed for the more proficient reader um, or the older reader. And then the, the shaded page on your right is the story design for the struggling reader. So the two images side by side tell the exact same story. It's just the one for the more advanced reader, more proficient reader has more text and less illustrations. And then the one for the, the student who's having a little trouble um, has much more illustrations and less text. Here, I just wanted to share each book has these support pages, which kind of give you insight on how shared reading works and how these books specifically work in a shared reading format. It gives you tips on like who might be the best uh, people to share books in a classroom setting. It also goes over the dyslexia friendly feature so you can have a little bit more insight to share with caregivers or anyone who has questions about how exactly these books can help. Um, and here's just some more so, uh, support pages. It tells you specifically which sounds are being addressed in the four stories in the book. It gives you a list of kind of the tricky sight words they might encounter, um, just so that your reader is really prepared and set up for success in trying to read these books. Um, the, the way that the intro pages outline which phonograms and sounds are being addressed in each book really can help you target books to the right readers. So if you have a more proficient reader who maybe just has troubles with certain areas, these books can provide great practice text for them because they can read every layer and get the practice they need on the sounds or issues that they're having struggles with. And finally, I did just want to mention again that ORCA is just a great resource for high-low material, specifically for middle grade and young adult. They produce, as you can see here on the slide, several different series, different topics, different genres um, for all interest levels and reading levels. Some of the reading levels go down as low as first grade for your kids that are really having some trouble um, but as you can see from the covers, these all look like what they are, which is contemporary books designed for older readers. So your older readers who maybe are having those struggles aren't going to feel embarrassed by having to carry maybe a little kitty book or something that is definitely too young for them in terms of subject matter, because their books through ORCA look like the books all their peers are carrying. Um, all of Orca's books, they publish new books in their series three times a year. So there's always new titles coming. And in the last year, they've started revising all of their older titles too. All of their older titles are being given new editions um, in what they call an ultra readable format. So again, they have dyslexia, dyslexic friendly fonts and typefaces, more spaces, the cream colored um, paper to help with contrast issues. Um, really close monitor text to make sure they're hitting those um, recommended uh, grade levels for the right kids who, who need uh, support at different levels. Um, and every book in the series is officially leveled by FNP, but more importantly for older readers, um, they all have Lexile levels. So you, again, you can find the best book for the best reader at whatever level. Um, I know that we kind of all know the statistic of if your kid isn't reading on level by age, uh, grade three, they might always be behind, but we don't want to lose sight of those kids as they get older and move through the school system. So ORCA, their high-low series can really kind of match those kids where they are at every grade level. So that's the last of, of the books that we have to share with you today. Um, if anyone has any questions, we're happy to answer anything or um, respond to any concerns you may have. We're looking at the chat. Oh, we're checking out the chat. Um, Elaine shared, um, oh, her experience, I don't know if everyone can see it, but her experience um, with an actual green book that's amazing. 
I would love to hear what you think about the book Stephanie presented and how it relates to like what you what you saw. Uh, yes, Nadra. So we do have a flyer. We have a flyer for all the books that were presented today that we're going to share with you. So there's going to be two different parts. Anybody that registered, so yourself included, will get a follow up email and that will have the flyer attached to it as well as the recording of the presentation. Um, and then I'll also attach that flyer in the next newsletter just so you have it in a couple places. But we do have that and it's ready to go for you all as well. And that was overwhelmingly in the first session, um, you're welcome. That mm -hmm. was really a lot of the feedback that we heard was that everybody loved that these books were geared towards those kiddos that needed a little bit more support giving that scaffolding and having that um, the different features in the text for those that do struggle with dyslexia, because we're seeing that as more of a concern. Um, Patty mentioned that, you know, she appreciates that these books are kind of uh, uh, being focused for kids with dyslexia. Um, I think more and more schools are realizing that there's just a lot of undiagnosed kids out there with dyslexia. Um, kids through the years who've been undiagnosed. I, I know we heard recently that the New York public school system has started kind of testing all their kids across the board for dyslexia, which can only help. And, and that I certainly imagine will kind of spread out from there, which is one of the reasons I chose this series from ORCA that I chose specifically because that's something they pay really close attention to with a lot of their series and isn't just something they do here and there. Um, so, oh, thanks. Good point, Missy. Missy agreed about the books for kids for with dyslexia. I'm glad that there's, um, I'm not glad that there's such a need for them, but I'm glad that that's a need that we can maybe help fill. I also love the book that talks about sustainability and where things come from. Yeah. Um, as you mentioned in the morning session, that's definitely something now it's kind of funny because even the kids that are on TikTok, there's a lot of TikTok videos now that talk about those things, which is such a nice topic for kids to be involved in. Yeah. And I think more now than ever, kids are starting to kind of think about, you know, yeah, I have this item, but what was the process until it came to me? You know, I think they're thinking of the backstory more and the implications of fashion and the way that we, you know, mm -hmm. live our lifestyles. So I love seeing that those use real photographs, they're real people, and they can make that connection and know it's so much bigger than just an mm -hmm. arbitrary item or a purchase, you know? Right. Um, the, the book with the interior shots was on fair trade in general, but I did want to point out on this cover image slide that they do have a book specifically that they just released a few months ago called Fashion Forward, specifically about fast fashion and um, sustainable style. And I will say just anecdotally that I read a different book for young adults on uh, fast fashion and kind of what you can do as a consumer to counteract um, some of those issues. And, and there, <laughs> the things they suggested you do was like, maybe subscribe to a thousand dollar a month couture rental line instead of buying it. <laughs> and I'm like, this book is designed for 17 year olds. And I'm sure there are 17 year olds out there who buy couture, but I'm not 17 and I can't buy the tour. <laughs> I need something much more practical. So when I saw the fashion forward book, it did, it was more practical for kids. It goes beyond kind of like thrift shop or buy used or, or second generation. And those certainly are valid reactions to, to kind of fast fashion. It's just the reuse, reduce, recycle approach, but it also gives actual practical information that goes beyond that. That doesn't include thousand dollar price tags <laughs> it's not fast fashion if you pay five hundred dollars for this handmade t-shirt that's beautiful that's not for me unfortunately I wish I could but yeah um so so yeah I like it that it's it's very um approachable and and usable for the dedicated interest level which is middle grade so the other thing that I love is that even looking at the covers 
every single cover is talking about a pretty complex topic mm -hmm. for kids, but they're using photographs of children on the cover. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. that's really powerful. Um, my 10 year old daughter, she's soon to be 11. She will look at a cover of a book and that like that, you know, they don't say don't judge it by its cover. Kids do, whether we or not we want to do. it. And <laughs> yeah, in that 30 seconds of, I don't know if I want to open it and go a little bit farther. I think that having children on the cover and students that are their age makes it really relatable, um, just in a very like instantaneous way where they can kind of see themselves in that, you know, windows and mirrors type like metaphor, you know? Yeah. yeah. That's a really great point. Um, and you're right throughout the books and especially on the covers, they, they do dedicate these books to kids in, in that middle grade, upper elementary, high school age group. Um, it, they're very practical books and also showing pictures of kids their age in other countries who kind of reap the negatives of these kinds of choices. Again, I think can promote a lot of SEL topics like empathy, um, seeing how your life as a 13 year old maybe relates to somebody else who has to farm for a living at 13 or, or um, something like that. So um, I also just wanted to point out, I included these pictures of the bananas on here mm -hmm. specifically, because I thought it was kind of a really good illustration about how something you see in the store, this, you know, the fair trade sticker on the banana, can just be turned around in kind of a simple way to promote activism and awareness with you have the, the teenagers in the banana costumes there just in a public square, you know, just it's something pretty simple. Um, but I thought that was just kind of a really good connection to make that something you see um, makes you think about like what you can do kind of in a grassroots way. I love the SEL connection. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, anybody have any last minute questions for our presenters? Thank you all so much for coming and spending time out of your day with us. Um, yeah, thank oh, you so okay. much for joining us. I totally agree, Elaine. There is... Um, definitely a need for the high low and those that reach, you know, one step further with the students with dyslexia. So yeah. I love that. And I love that it's a new series. Um, I mean, we have a lot of high low series. We have a lot of graphic novels, but this one seems to kind of marry the two genres, mm -hmm. which I really like. Years ago, I had some Orca books. I don't remember what company, but anyway, I thought they were great then, but these look even better. The pictures are great. They've been updated. So they really good. take a lot of care in keeping them current yeah. because that keeps them relevant. Like right. um, Emily stated, you know, they're approachable, they're relatable, and they they really take. I, I work personally with Orca, so I'm probably the most familiar with their titles. Um, and that is one of the reasons why we kind of chose them as someone to help sponsor, just because. They, I, I personally know that they take that extra care. And mm -hmm. as you mentioned here with the, the First Peoples, First Nations books, um, I, don't, I didn't know this, but I don't know how many of you may know, but in Canada, there are laws that say a certain percentage of what you publish has to be, has to come from Native voices. And so I think it's up to 30% of like what ORCA does first by law has to to kind of give voice to those marginalized communities who haven't had one, which I think is a really great um, thing to have on the books, but they go above and beyond that by not just kind of mass producing anything to take care of those commitments. Um, they actually go out of their way. I've read some great graphic novel series from them. Um, again, to have contemporary perspectives. I was at a, a conference recently and one of the sessions I was at was said something about making sure that the books and material you have dealing with indigenous peoples is set in the present because we tend to think about these communities in the past. So having contemporary series set in modern day everyday life 
um, I think is, is kind of a really great addition to a global perspective in the classroom to, to voices and communities that we, we just have not heard from enough yep. in years. So yes, and uh, that's a great point, um, Nadja, about Native American Heritage Month. That was November, um, if, if anyone didn't realize, that's great. I'm glad you like that. I'm glad you like them. I'm so pleased. <laughs> it's always hard picking books for these kinds of talks because there's so many favorites you kind of have to pare down and, you know, what's your favorite child? So um, <laughs> it's always nice when people like what we share. All right. Thank you both so much for presenting for us today. Thank you for everybody for taking time out of your day to spend with us. And let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise, look for that follow-up email and the flyer in the newsletter if you're a sales consultant. Yep.